Hey, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to welcome you. It's Friday, 8.30, and that's when we're celebrating Vision Research. So I'm delighted to see uh, familiar faces and, and those who are maybe for the first time. And today is my great pleasure to welcome uh, from very sunny London, uh, Mike Cheatham, my, my dear friend uh, and colleague and leader in the field. Uh, so we're really delighted that he found time uh, to join and share his research. And so as a next step will be uh, Sam Du, who is going to introduce Mike. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Du, and I'm an MBPhD student in the lab of uh, Krzysztof Pauczewski. And, and welcome to the Center of Translational Vision Research's Distinguished Speaker Series. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Michael Cheatham, a truly outstanding investigator over the years, uh, to our speaker series, where he will be presenting his work about the use of retinal organoids to model retinal diseases and develop therapies. Dr. Cheatham is a professor of molecular and cell biology at University College London in the UK, where he is also a member of the Institute of Ophthalmology and the Faculty of Brain Sciences. He received his BSc with honors in genetics from the University of Wales, Swansea, and went on to receive his PhD with Brian Anderson in biochemistry from the University of London in 1991. During his PhD and two subsequent postdoctoral fellowships, he developed an interest in the cell biology and pathogenesis of neurodegeneration. He then established his lab at the UCL Institute of Ophthalmology, where he has subsequently studied mechanisms and therapies for inherited retinal and neurodegenerative diseases, such as retinitis pigmentosa, Huntington's disease, and ALS. A particular focus of his group has been the study of proteostasis and aberrant proteins in these disease processes. He has also been developing AAV-based and antisense oligonucleotide-based therapies for IRDs, including groundbreaking work on the use of an ASO against SEP290, which is currently in clinical trials. With an H index of over 66 and over 170 peer-reviewed publications, Dr. Cheatham has been making sustained contributions to our understanding of the mechanisms of photoreceptor cell death, ranging from protein degradation to cilia defects. He has received major funding awards from agencies such as the Wellcome Trust, Foundation Fighting Blindness, and the Moorfields Eye Charity. Of course, he has also been active in the community as a peer reviewer for many grant awarding agencies and journals. I'm looking forward to learning more from Dr. Cheatham uh, about his most recent work. So please join me in welcoming him to our seminar. Oh, wrong one. All right. Try this again. Here we go. How are we doing? Can you see that okay? Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Shang Du, for the introduction. It's a real honor to be here in this uh, seminar series. Uh, you've had really the the best people uh, so far, and I'm sure many more outstanding scientists to come. So it's a real honor to be uh, part of that faculty of uh, the Friday morning 8.30 ophthalmology people. Uh, today, I'm gonna to talk about some of our work on retinal organoids and how we've been using them to model disease and to test and uh, various therapies. Um, obviously, lots of other people have done amazing work in the field of retinal organoids, but I'm really gonna focus mainly on the work that's come out of our lab. And I'll, I'll touch on a few other things in, in different places, but uh, let's see. So I'm sure most of you know, but the focus is gonna be on inherited retinal dystrophies in the, in the field of ophthalmology. Um, and we're really gonna mainly focus on LCA, labus congenital amaurosis, which is a severe early onset retinal dystrophy that affects both rod and cone function. I'm also gonna to touch on cone dystrophies and retinitis pigmentosa. Um, but I won't be saying too much about any of the clinical presentations of these. It's very much uh, viewed from the, the retina in the dish point of view here. Now, anybody who works on inherited retinal dystrophies will know that there's a great deal of uh, heterogeneity genetically. You know, there's over 200 genes that have been identified that are associated with inherited retinal dystrophies. And that can be a bit of a problem when you're doing these very detailed studies. Now, fortunately, in some ways, they converge on a series of pathways. And so we can sort of learn things through 
studying one disease gene that can then be inferred to some of the others. Now, from this schematic from Anakin and Holder's review back over 13 years ago, so I probably should update this slide, but there's some common themes. So there's the transport of proteins from the inner segment to the outer segment of, of photoreceptors, which is limited by the connecting cilia and the cilia transport. And a lot of these genes that it cause inherited random dystrophies are involved in cilia transport. And I'm going to talk about two of those today, SEP290 and RP2. The retinoid cycle is also another point of uh, confluence. And I'm going to touch briefly on ABCA4 today as well. And of course, the phototransduction cascade is central to whatever a uh, photoreceptor does uh, in terms of its uh, function in detecting light and not so much going to talk about those despite the fact my lab works very intensively on rhodopsin. Now it's quite a long time ago now it's back to 2006 uh, when Shinji Yamanaka's demonstrated that you could reprogram uh, a somatic cell back to the pluripotent state so that you could then differentiate it into, in effect, every tissue in the body. Now, this caused an immense amount of excitement in terms of regenerative medicine, but also in terms of the potential for disease modeling. Because what it enables us to do is to take a patient cell, reprogram it to the pluripotent state by the introduction of these Yamanaka factors, as we call them, and derive pluripotent stem cells that we can then generate into virtually any tissue. Now that's the limiting factor there is how well you can do this um, differentiation. Now in terms of making RPE, so the RPE photoreceptor functional unit, RPE was solved nearly 20 years ago in terms of how to make RPE from stem cells. But photoreceptors were more challenging. Yeah? And what really sort of helped the solve this conundrum, and this isn't our work, this is work from several amazing labs around the world, but you know, making the shift from growing stem cells in two dimensions to growing them in three dimensions. So the work of you know, Jason Meyer and David Gamm, the really groundbreaking work of Sasai's group when they actually you know, generated these optic cups that made the front cover of Nature back in 2011. And then they showed they could do this with human IPSC a year later. And then other groups like Valerie Pantasolaire have modified these protocols, refined the characterization. And now there's a great number of different methods and refinements that are available to anyone entering this field. I'm not gonna, I don't, I'm not gonna have time to go through the different methods. We use two or three different methods in my lab and that has to be tailored to the particular IPSC. So IPS themselves can be quite challenging to work with. So what happens when you do these, um, these differentiations? So you start with your indu induced pluripotent stem cells. You culture those uh, to a point where you start, and then you, know, you push them using different uh, trophic factors towards a neuroepithelial effect. And you'll get this, this neuroepithelial domain starting to appear after a few weeks. So this is like takes about 30 days and you get this neuroblastic layer you can see here, which is often surrounded by renal pigment epithelium. Now, in general, we excise these from a 2D culture. If we're doing a, an adherent uh, suspension method, as opposed to a pure suspension method. So the original SASI method was all in suspension, but the David Gamm method and the Tantasolaire method evolves adherent culture. And we find they're slightly more efficient than the suspension only cultures. Now, when you, when you have these in adherent culture, you then need to basically isolate them. So in the old days, we used to manually excise them, which was quite tricky. These days, it's more of a uh, checkerboard. So we tend to scrape the plate and these domains will then pop up. And as you grow them over extended time, this neuroepithelial domain continues to develop and differentiate, eventually forming a uh, relatively mature retinal organoid. And this is what we call a retinal organoid. Now, 
look down under phase contrast, you can see they're characterized by this brush border of fine little filaments and hairs. Now you look at those in a little bit more detail, you can see these are the inner and outer segments protruding from this outer nuclear layer that you can see here. Now, this isn't the greatest of uh, resolutions. Now, you know, in terms of where we need technology, we need technology to be able to image these better. There's been some advances in terms of using and applying OCT imaging to these. If we could do this routinely, it would certainly make our life a lot easier if we could see what was inside before we had to crack them open. When you do crack them open, what you see is that in the early stages, so up to four months, I'm, I'm sure some of you are thinking, how can up to four months be early? But it's uh, the problem with this system is it basically in vitro is mimicking in utero. So we're working on a similar time scale to how the human retina develops in vivo during development. So it actually takes a very long time. And it means that these, these are very long term, uh, long experiments to do. Now, around 90 days, the neuroblastic layer starts to commit to the photoreceptor fate and all of the different cell types come out. The first cells to appear are the retinal ganglion cells. They're also the first type of cells to start disappearing because they don't seem to be uh, capable of staying around for very long in high numbers in the mature stage three organoids. So like from about day 150 onwards, you start getting these mature uh, retinal organoids with the inner and outer segments and developed photoreceptors. And they start expressing all of the characteristic phototransduction genes that you expect in rods and cones. So we look at a bit more detail in a schematic of, of how they look when you do cross-section them and stain them with a range of markers. You can see that they have most of the neural retinal cells that you expect in the normal human retina. So they have rods and cones, they have bipolar cells, horizontal cells, amacrine cells, and they have a few ganglion cells, but the ganglion cells are now starting to drop out. So there's fewer ganglion cells than you might expect in the human retina. You have more cells tying the whole thing together. And what you're missing is we don't have blood vessels and we don't have some of the astrocytes, yeah? So these come in later during development. And so it's not so surprising that they're not there. Now, when you look for the differences, the, the first difference everyone notices is that there's no overlying RPE to protect and nurture the photoreceptor outer segments. And we think this might be one of the reasons the outer segments don't develop properly. So they develop, but they are essentially still immature. But all of the other features of the photoreceptor are there. So you have a mitochondria-rich inner segment, you have a connecting cilium that looks very, very similar. You have the ribbon synapses. And so it's a great model system to look at photo human photoreceptor biology in vitro. So we take a bit of a closer look at the how the outer segment forms. And you can see that it starts around day 90 and then it elongates over the next 100 days or so. And this is very similar to what you see in the developing mouse retina, where, but they seem to get stuck around a relatively immature stage, and they never seem to quite manage to reach full maturation. Now, this might be the lack of trophic factors or the lack of the overlying RPE, but sometimes you can get relatively good organized discs within these rudimentary outer segments. And here you can see the connecting cilia, and the basal body. Okay. <clears throat> so now I've done the introduction, I'm going to talk to you about some different examples. Now, going back, I think over 10 years now, is when we started to work on retinal organoids. We were inspired by the, the SASI work, and we started trying to copy that and see if we could use it to model disease. And the first disease we were working on was labor congenital amaurosis, which was caused by bilelic pathogenic variants in a gene CEP290, which is a very large gene, too large to fit in AAV, which uh, causes a range of both retina only and syndromic disease. And CEP290 is an important cilia associated protein and it's required for ciliogenesis. 
Now, one of the curious things about uh, SEP290 LCA or LCA10 is that it's, it's also the most common manifestation of variants in, in SEP290. It's still a rare disease, but it's the most common uh, it's the most common cause of LCA, and it's also the most common outcome of a variant in SEP290. And that is actually associated with a high preponderance of this deep intronic change, uh, which is between exons 26 and 27. I'm going to explain a bit more about that now. You actually find that in well over 60% of LCA10 patients. And you never find that allele in the patients that have syndromic disease. And this was something of a conundrum. So this deep intronic change was identified by Annika Den Hollander back in 2006. And here's, here's the change, this little G here. And what it does, it changes uh, a splicing silencer and enhancer so that you get this introduction of this pseudo exon here between exon 26 and 27. And the consequences of this pseudo exon being included, this exon X, is that you get an immediate stop code on right at the start of the pseudo exon. So it, it leads to a non-functional protein. Now we took a skin biopsy from a homozygous patient with this variant, and we were gonna use them to make, we made IPS from them and we we're gonna study them. And then we were motivated to not use RPE, but to make retinal organoids going back 10 years. Now, one of the reasons to look at this is uh, Rob Collin and Alex Garanto had actually made a humanized mouse of, of this variant. But when they did this, they found a, a lot of unexpected splicing events in the mouse. So there's actually very little uh, correct splicing for the LCA10. And you know, so it was, it was very difficult to work to use this model to understand how this variant led to disease. So it meant that the retinal organoids were an ideal complementary system. And it really emphasizes why uh, the human genomic context in the right cell type is so critical. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the pseudoexon. So if you take patient cells, be it lymphoblasts or uh, fibroblasts, dermal fibroblasts, you can see the presence of exon X. So here's a, an RT-PCR across exons 26, 27, and in controls, you only have a single band of the correct size. Exon X leads to this larger band, and you can see that it's a hypomorphic variant in these. So this is a homozygous patient, but 50% of the transcripts are actually normal wild type. Now, this is a biallelic recessive disease. So the fact that you have 50% of normal transcript would generally mean that the disease wouldn't be penetrant. And yet here we have a retina only disease in patients. So why do we have this? So is there a difference between different cell types? And the answer is yes, there is. So this was the most striking thing. As soon as we made the organoids from these, we couldn't detect any SEP290 expression. But when we looked at the transcripts, we have this striking shift from almost 50-50 normal to pseudo exon to more of a 80-20 or 90-10 ratio. So that now we have a relatively simple explanation as to why the retina is so affected in individuals with this change. It's because in most other tissues, it's hypomorphic and you still get sufficient SEP290. However, in the retina and in photoreceptors, you get more aberrant splicing and less correct functional protein. So when's that happening? Why is it happening? So if we follow that over time, we can see it starts kicking in between six and 13 weeks of organoid development. And so here we can see we go a shift from more like 50-50 in the IPS to again, 90-10, 80-20. Now, interestingly, that coincides with the introduction of retinal isoforms of other genes. For example, uh, BBSA or RPGR. And so there seems to be something related to how photoreceptors use alternative splicing to maximize and specialize their genome. Okay, so knowing that there's an aberrant splicing, it's relatively, you know, it's, it's not necessarily straightforward, but a, a, 
a very clear therapeutic approach there is to use antisense oligonucleotides to modify splicing. And they can be used to either include or exclude uh, exons. Now, in this case, we want to exclude exon X. And that sort of splice switching is relatively straightforward to do. Now, we knew this was going to work for, well, we were very optimistic it was going to work for CEP290 because two groups uh, back in 2012 had shown that this could be used in patient fibroblasts and patient lymphoblasts, both Rob Collins' group and Jean-Michel Rosé's group had shown this. <coughs> so we wanted to design our own uh, antisense oligonucleotide. We weren't quite sure how cells were going to take up. Um, the organoids were going to take up the antisense oligos. So we went for a, a morpholino approach, which is a, just a different type of modified antisense oligo. And we designed an oligo which was over the splice site junction and the actual change. So it was, to some extent, slightly allele specific. And we used the morpholino with a reagent called endoporter, which facilitates its entry into cell. And here you can see that the, the fluorescently labeled morpholino is uptaken by the outer nuclear layer and the photoreceptors within the organoid. So with that confidence that we could actually get it into the cells, we treated some organoids for three weeks with the morpholino. And here you can see we have the characteristic high preponderance of X on X. We add our morpholino and we return it back to the 50-50 levels. So we're getting about a five-fold increase in the amount of full-length transcripts. And that corresponded with an increase in the ciliation and the cilia length in the photoreceptors. So around the time we were working on this, we we met with ProQR and it turned out they'd been working on this for a while, uh, I think initially with Rob, and then they came to us with our organoid model and said, can you test our clinical trial ready and sense oligo? And they'd optimized an oligo called QR110. We actually tested one other oligo for them and we were amazed at how well it worked. It worked much better than, than uh, our morpholino did. So we worked with uh, ProQR and we tested out QR110. And you can see here very, how clearly it suppresses X on X at relatively low doses and increases the amount of the correct transcript. And you can quantify that. So it's kicking in even at low doses, but it really starts being effective between one and three micromole. You can quantify that in terms of actual real copy using DDPCR, which is one of the favorite tools down at ProQR. And you can also see that even the low doses very effectively suppress X on X. When you look at the consequences of that for the organoids, you can see that there's a, an increase in ciliation of the photoreceptors and also the length increases. And again, this is cutting in around one to three micromole. So this sort of proof of efficacy in a human retina in a dish was used as part of a data package to convince the FDA that they could let this part of a safety package that let, let this go forward to a clinical trial. And this clinical trial was, was run by Arta Sedisian, who's here on the call. So I'm not gonna say very much about this at all. I just wanna flag you in the direction of how well you can use organoids to predict potential clinical outcome. <clears throat> now the phase one, two for this trial went actually very well. So there's, there was the original short-term interim report in Nature Medicine. There was a follow-up report in Nature Medicine and Art has also published a, <clears throat> a study on an individual patient who only had a single injection and had very prolonged effects. I'm just gonna give you the headline data from the end of the one year data that there was a good improvement in visual acuity, in light sensitivity and in mobility. And this was all working best around this dose here which was picked as a target dose for the phase two, three trials. Now this happens to correspond approximately to somewhere between one and three micromolar in the retinal organoid, in the retinal organoid. So we were almost predicting uh, outcome. Now, the fly in the ointment is that this has gone to phase three and it failed to meet its endpoints. Now, that was a big disappointment to many of us. And I think really it comes down to trial design over the drug itself. 
Now, I'm still optimistic myself that someone's going to pick this drug up and do the trial again in a way that regulators are happy with. That now we can take the data from this trial. But I'm going to hand that over you know, to someone who's more experienced and has got more uh, interest in that. I'm sure we'll tell you about that in the future. OK, so going back to this slide and, you know, so you've got these you've got a lot of patients with this deep intronic variant that might be treatable with Cepafarsan or a gene editing approach that Editas were developing. Um, but there's not very much for the other alleles. So there's a few other alleles that have been targeted with um, other antisense oligonucleotides to other exons. But is there some way we could treat all of them or, or, or treat some of these in another way? Now, back in 2018, a South Korean group identified the flavonoid eupatalin and several other flavonoids as compounds that could improve ciliation in CEP290 null RPE1 cells. And they went on to treat RD16, which are CEP290 mice, with eupatalin and saw some improvements in cone function. Now, these are very, very fast, aggressive model of RD. So getting any improvement, I think, is very encouraging. This was encouraging enough. Uh, so we had a dialogue with Brian Mansfield, FFB, and Brian was very keen that we should try this in, in retinal organoids and see if it worked or if we could even replicate the study. So we went away and we made our own, uh, our own CEP290 knockout RP1 cells, and lo and behold, we managed to replicate their effect on ciliation and cilia length. We also replicated the dose response. So the dose response that's critical is around between 5 and 10 to get an effect. And we also went on to test this in LCA10 fibroblasts. So here in the LCA10 fibroblasts show a, a delay in ciliation that can be rescued with eupatalin and also an improvement in cilia length. But really we wanted to look at what happened in the retina. So we made some iPS cells which are knocked out for LCA10, for CEP290. And we also had our LCA10 IPS. We made retinal organoids out of these and we studied these mainly at day 120, the same as we had done with the QR110 and our own morpholino. And we used ciliation as a readout. And if you look at ciliation, the CEP290 knockouts and the LCA10 both have reduced ciliation that is improved with eupatalin treatment. And the cilia length is also reduced and that is also improved with eupatalin. So it does translate from RPE1 cells through to photoreceptors. Another interesting thing we noticed is when we treated more mature LCA10 uh, organoids with eupatalin, we could see an effect on opsin staining. So in controls, you mainly have by day 180, the, the opsin is mainly in the outer segment. So it's been synthesized in the inner segments and the cell body and it's trafficked to the outer segment. In the CEP290 organoids, the LCA10 organoids, you can see that, that there's very few outer segments and a lot of the opsin is retained within the outer nuclear layer. However, when you treat with eupatalin, that amount of retention is reduced and the amount of opsin in the outer segment appears to increase. So how's that mediated? Well, we know at some level this is mediated transcriptionally because eupatalin reduces the level of rhodopsin expression. It also seems to affect cilia-associated genes. So it looks like there's some direct effects of eupatalin on the, on the cilium. Now, this reduction in rhodopsin could actually be a good thing. It's a transient effect. So if you remove the eupatalin, rhodopsin levels return to normal. But um, actually reducing the burden of opsin that needs to be trafficked to the outer segment could be an important feature of helping the rhodopsin that's remaining to traffic properly and also to uh, have less detrimental effects on the cell. So we're quite excited about this now. We've, we're testing eupatalin on a range of different ciliopathies to see how translatable it might be, not just across a range of CEP290 patients, but also to other types of ciliopathy. And hopefully we'll be more coming out soon on that soon. Okay, so I quickly want to mention something on Stargardt's disease. So Stargardt's disease is the most common Mendelian eye disorder, and it's caused by 
biallelic variants in ABCA4. Now we've got Bob Molday on the call, who's an expert on ABCA4 function, so I'm not going to say very much about that. Now, what I do want to highlight is, is a recent study we've done together with ProQR, and it was focused on this. It's not a deep intronic. It's, it's a very close to exonic variant, a minus 10 change. You never quite know what a change around minus 10 is going to do to the exon, to the splicing. This is the most common severe variant uh, in, Star in ABCA4 disease. And Franz Kramer's group showed that this leads to the skipping of exons 39 or both exons 39 and 40. So the team at ProQR had been trying to develop an antisense oligonucleotide which could stimulate the inclusion of exons 39 and 40 in these uh, in these uh, patients. And we used homozygous gene edited and patient uh, lines for this minus 10 change and made retinal organoids from them. And when you do that, you can see that in the wild type organoid, it's all full length transcript. There's no particular problem making ABCA4, but in the both the gene edited and the patient organoids, most of the the vast majority, there's very, very little full length ABCA4. Most of it skips exon 39 and 40, and some of it just skips exon 39. Now, the oligonucleotide in this case is called QR1011, and we can see that when we treat uh, patient cells with this, we get a very good dose response between 1.5 and 3 micromolar, where we can see we're getting restoration of full length transcripts up to an over 50%. When we look at the ABCA4 protein, we can see in retinal organoids, it's normally detected predominantly in the outer segment, counter-stained here with rhodopsin. In the minus 10 untreated cells, there's no ABCA4 detectable in the outer segment. And hopefully you can see these little faint spots of yellow here, where we've now rescued ABCA4 into the outer segment. When Melitta looked at the amount of ABCA4 for protein that was there, we can see it's between 30 and 40% that's been restored in these. And this might be enough to be therapeutic. And I'm really hoping that this will also make its way to the clinic in future, because there's a lot of patients who could benefit from this if it's effective. Okay, I'm gonna quickly shift to a different type of RP. So in this case, uh, excellent RP caused by variants in RP2. So these are generally loss of function variants, a lot of stop mutations, a lot of premature termination uh, codons, and in particular, this ARG120 stop is a mutational hotspot. So it crops up around the world in different populations and is relatively common. Now, RP2 functions as a GTPase activating protein for a, uh, sorry, a, yeah, a GTPA so activating protein for a small GTPase, ARL3, and the GEF for that is ARL13, which is, so these are all, these are critical cilia associated proteins, and they're involved in the delivery of lipidated proteins to the outer segment. Now, we actually started working on RP2 uh, IPS derived retinal organoids about the same time we were doing the CEP290, but it wasn't as easy to, to work out. And, we had some interesting observations and we weren't quite sure what to make of them because it was still the early days. And I'll explain what they are later, but basically what we had to do was make our own isogenic knockout to have more confidence in our findings. So at this stage, we used CRISPR editing to make a, 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 an indel, which uh, led to a premature termination codon in uh, RP2, very similar to the R120X, and we're working on two different patients, and we've completely ablated RP2 expression. Now we can make organoids from these. Now you may already have some clue that these organoids don't look quite like the controls. If you look at the outer nuclear layer, where the photoreceptors are, you can see it's thinner. Yeah, now I'm going to go through that in a little bit more detail later. But apart from that, they look superficially very similar. So they do have outer segments, and they are developing properly. Um, but as I said, one of the things we noticed when we were growing the patient organoids is that 
they weren't developing as well as the controls we were using. And so this is where the isogenic control became really important to us because when we looked at the isogenic control, it showed the same phenotype. So it, all we've done here is knock out RP2 and it's showing the same thinner outer nuclear layer as the controls. And we can measure that in a, in a large number of organoids for so two different patients and the knockout. Now, this is only observable at day 180. We couldn't observe that before at 120 or 150. We didn't see that. So if we went back and did some tunnel staining to see what was going on across the different time points, we can see that there's an as a peak of tunnel reactivity around 150 days. So we think something that's happening at 150 days is stimulating some of the cells to die and then they're lost. Yeah? So there's a peak around day 150. When we did RNA-seq at day 150, the most commonly induced genes were P53 signaling pathway and cell death pathway. So again, confirming that we think there's an induction of cell death there. Now, which cells are affected? So it looked like it was the ROTs because the cone numbers were not affected. If anything, they were increased, but the number of cells expressed in rhodopsin were very much reduced. And day 150 is about the time point when the cells really start switching their rhodopsin expression on. So we also wanted to see if we could rescue this. So we worked with Jane Farah's group uh, in Dublin, and they had made a very nice uh, RP2 overexpression AAV. And we transduced organoids with that and got beautiful transduction of the outer nuclear layer. Very good transduction levels of both rods and cones. Yeah. There's a little bit of a spoiler here. You can see the rhodopsin expressions come back. And indeed, the rhodopsin expression is increased. But also, you can see now the outer nuclear layer is thicker. So we're actually taking that back pretty much to control levels. So the gene augmentation is reversing the cell death phenotype we saw with the RP2. So you can use retinal organoids to study photoreceptor cell death. But can you do it for every disease model? And I, I, I want to mention this because, you know, going back to 2018, uh, a Chinese group had shown that for RPGR, they also saw uh, an increase in cell death as their organoids matured. More recently, Pierre Garot's group have seen that with PRPF31 retinal organoids, but it's not an absolute, you know, because my colleague Jackie van der Spey's group here at UCL have thoroughly studied AIPL1, which is another severe LCA gene. Now, so you would predict if this was a universal thing, the LCA uh, diseases would be show an earlier, uh, earlier onset, uh, but they don't. So there's no sign of increased tunnel reactivity. There's no reduction in the thickness of the ONL. So what the critical factors are that tips some of these models over into degeneration and degeneration too early almost, because this is a developmental model, we don't know. We don't know. It must be something in the in the culture conditions that's making them particularly vulnerable. But that's something you know that's going to need, need to be worked on in the in the in the future. So I'm just going to finish off by telling you how you can use uh, retinal organoids to help solve more complex disease mechanisms, and this is really exploiting their the fact they have the right genomic context in the right cell type. Yeah. So this goes back to the first um, genetic pedigree ever drawn up at Moorfields Eye Hospital by Marcel J over 35 years ago. It's this massive pedigree. And it's, it's actually much, much bigger than that. So we know there's a, there's a founder effect here. Uh, but it had been refractory to being solved. So we found and identified a lot of ADPR dominant RP genes. You know, the first identified was rhodopsin, but we still have actually a lot of that are unexplained, even with next generation sequencing. You know, dominant families are not so amenable to the next generation sequencing in terms of it's far, far more difficult to, to find genes, but it does imply there's some miss, missing heritability and what's causing it. So our whole genome sequencing identify that this family actually had a large, well, relatively large, complex duplication inversion event on chromosome 17 around this gene YPEL2. Now our colleagues in, in Radboud, uh, Suzanne Rusing and Suzanne De Bruyne, have been working 
on their own very large Dutch family, which had been mapped to RP17 on chromosome 17, and they'd found no variant in CA4. So carbonic anhydrase 4 had been implicated as the causative gene for RP17. And yet you had these individuals who didn't have any pathogenic variants in them. And they'd found a, a du simple duplication in a very similar region. It's different, but it's similar. And so this Im implied that it was probably structural variants at this locus that were causing disease. And indeed, if you go, th so with Suzanne and Suzanne and Alessia and Alison in, here in London, managed to identify eight different structural variants around the world from South Africa in the original RP17 families that have initially been reported to be CA4, Canadian families, other Dutch families, and other UK families with different structural variants, but all in a very similar region. So what's causing the RP? So are there any clues from the um, epigenetic data? So Tim Cherry's Epigenetic data was very, very useful in this, looking at this. And <clears throat> when you actually look at the, the region and where these genes, so these are the genes that are often duplicated, are the breakpoints always usually somewhere around this link, yeah? It's here. When you look at the retina expression, you can see that YPEL2, although we don't know what it does, is actually quite highly expressed in retina. And that actually comes along with a couple of retinal enhancers in this region here, yeah? And then we have, it's insulated from the rest of the region by two CTCF boundaries, yeah? So we have, the, we think this is a topologically associated domain where these enhancers can drive the expression of YPEL2. That was the model. So we did, so we worked with Stefan Mundlos and Wuri Mello to, to study this region using low input high C. And we use retinal organoids from controls and our UK family that we made retinal organoids from. And we looked and see how they were different. So as predicted, the YPEL region does have its own topologically associated domain, which insulates it from the rest of the region and protects that enhancer from elsewhere. When we look at the the RP17 family and the RP17 organoids, we now have what we call a neotad, a new tad, where this enhancer can now access other genes in the region. So it's easier to see a little bit in this model here. So this would be the normal situation where you have these boundaries insulating YPL2 and the enhancer from the rest of the region. So it forms this loop where the enhancer acts directly on the gene. Now, in the case of <laughs> SV1, we now have the enhancer acting on two different genes, GDPD1 and SMG8. And indeed, when we do qPCR to look at this, we can see increased levels of GDPD1 and SMG8. When we do the predictions of the other families, we can see in the case of the Dutch family that now we have a different structural variant, a different outcome. So now we have this enhancer acting on a new copy of YPEL2 and also GDPD1. So in this case, the NeoTAD has GDPD1 and YPEL2 in it. And when the Dutch group did qPCR on 2D photosynthesis precursor cells, they could see increased levels of YPEL2 and GDPD1, which makes us think that the common mechanism action here is increased levels of GDPD1, which is a relatively unstudied enzyme which has structural similarities to snake venom and spider toxin. So you can sort of see why too much of it in your photoreceptors might not be a good thing. Now, importantly, you can only study this in retinal cells because these topologically associated domains are, have, can have tissue specificity and it highlights again, the importance of being able to model this in the right cells. Okay, so I think that's about it. I've covered quite a lot. I really need to go through and thank the people who've been doing the work. I'm trying to do it in the, in the order we've talked about it. So our SEP290 work was really picked off initially by Connor Ramsden trying to replicate the SASI protocol. And Amelia Lane and David Parfit really picked up the, uh, the baton with that. And then Monica Aguila uh, worked with uh, ProQR, 
with uh, Cal Yandola and P. Adamson to push forward the preclinical testing of Cepafasa. Um, the studies on ABCA4, in particular in my group, well, they've really been driven by uh, Melita Kaltak and Jim Swildens at uh, ProQR, and in my group, Sung and Lee and uh, Davide Piccolo have really helped with that in terms of making those. In terms of the Eupatalin study, sorry, I should have done that next. Uh, the Eupatalin story has really been driven by Julio Corral Serrano with Paul Sladen and Danielle, Daniele Ossobiani. And that was really done actually with the, with the encouragement of uh, Brian Mansfield when he was still at FFB. Um, the RP17 story has been a fantastic collaboration with uh, Suzanne Riesing and Suzanne de Bruin. And of course, been driven by my wife, Alison Hardcastle here in London and Alessia Fiorentina, Daniele and Julio really helped with that. And now Vasilis, D and Sara are, are continuing the baton of growing these very uh, complex structural variants in organoids. And we do like to have fun. It's not all hard work here in London. Thank you, Chris. I can see you're, you're back on. Thank you so much, Michael. All right, let me start with one question. Can you comment on this organoids, whether you routinely or will or do functional assay, how we respond to the light and, uh, and can you comment on cones as well? Yeah, so there's been a beautiful study on, on cone function in organoids. Um, and there's been lots of reports of different ways of doing functional assays in, in the organoids. Um, I have to say we tried we've tried different methods ourselves. Um, we've not found anything ourselves yet, which we think is robust enough to use in a sort of a disease modeling and disease rescue context. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think the most the most efficient ways are, are are either calcium imaging. Sorry, is that my? I can hear you. Uh, Tim, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it might be my, I think someone might be calling me on Teams. I can't, you can't switch it off, unfortunately, if you're not muted. Um, okay, so sorry, what was saying? So yeah, um, I think the most robust measures are either direct patch clamping or, or calcium imaging of photoreceptors. Those are the most robust data I've seen on it. And I think it clearly can be done. It's clearly not the case that every photoreceptor is uh, responsive. These are relatively low throughput methods. And I think to do them in a, on a scale where you'd want to be able to say, here's the control, here's the disease, here's the therapy and rescue them. I think we're still a little way from that. I'd like to see it happen. I think it's definitely the, uh, the critic, one of the critical things, but um, I think we're still a little bit away from that. Um, we're still waiting. We're sort of waiting really for someone else to solve this for us, I think. Um, we're sort of waiting and hoping someone's going to find a nice, easy way to do it. And that is a bit more amenable to higher throughput. But, What's but your thoughts, Chris? You're, you're, you're an expert. There's a lot of rhodopsin. I mean, you, most likely it's opsin, right? Uh, so mm. would that be causal of distress to the system that is continuous activating and utilizing, uh, you know, signal transduction as a way of excitation for the cell? Yeah, it's it's possible. Um, I think what we need, you know, is I think in some ways what we've done is we've modeled we've modeled diseases without necessarily modeling the most interesting ones to dissect first transduction. Mm -hmm. um, All right, let's uh, let's move on to uh, Sam. Uh, Sam has a question, and then Genix, Emma, and Dorota. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Cheatham, uh, Sam here again. So uh, really interesting work. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on uh, Editas Medicine's recent CRISPR uh, trial. So I'm just gonna stop sharing so I can find this Teams and switch it off. Sorry, yeah. Uh, in Editas, Sorry, what were you saying? In Editas Medicine's a recent CRISPR trial. Yes. Uh, they're using CRISPR to avoid this IBS uh, site. 
they only re really reported a um, effect in the homozygous patients. And I was wondering if you could comment on whether you think that um, this therapy would be applicable in heterozygous patients, and or if that the mRNA splicing um, is enough to explain that effect. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, obviously, if you've got two copies and you're targeting just that variant, if you've got two copies, you've got much better potential for benefit. Yeah, your potential benefit is doubled in terms of how much uh, products you may or may not get. Um, now, I think the challenges with the the CRISPR strategy, I mean, it's an elegant strategy, but the challenges are around efficiency and transduction efficiency. Now, one of the benefits of the ASO approach has been that it's it's uptaken by most of the, the photoreceptors. So you actually get very good efficiency of, of, of target. What you get then is a delayed action. Now, I really should probably pass over to Arthur on this because he's, he's, he's the one who's studied these patients in the most detail. But I think there's good evidence from the phase one, two uh, Sepafarsan trial that you really can get benefit in heterozygous patients. Um, so I think theoretically, there's no reason why a heterozygous patient shouldn't benefit. Now, whether they would also benefit from some other therapy, such as uh, Upatlin or something else, I think it's, it's quite likely they would. Yeah. Okay. Jane. Arthur, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Uh, and no, I, I, you, you covered it well, I think, to the level that we know. Uh, uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the patient's function that varies from patient to patient, uh, at least by our reading and review of the literature, there doesn't seem to be a difference between uh, homozygosity versus compound heterozygosity for this mutation. Um, so that leads me uh, to believe that... Uh, in terms of potential treatments, uh, at least to the level that we can measure, there does not seem to be uh, a, a difference. Um, and uh, we have seen uh, definitely believable large effects uh, in uh, both uh, compound heterozygous as well as homozygous patients. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Chetan, uh, James Liu here from the Palchevsky Lab. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. My question is, so you had demonstrated how the CEP290 and the ABCA4 variants uh, led to the absence of full-length functional protein. I was wondering if you looked at how much uh, mutant truncated protein could be resulting from some of these mutations uh, that might be more prone to aggregation, thereby contributing to disease. We've not been able to detect <clears throat> any truncated protein in either of those, so. <coughs> So I'm not sure there is any. I think there's there's quite a lot of nonsense mediated decay in both cases. So I think there's less transcripts and there's less protein produced. And I think most of what's produced is efficiently de degraded, I think. And these are classic loss of function diseases with you know recessive inheritance patterns. So you know, there's there's always there's always the potential for truncated proteins to have a deleterious effect. But I think in these cases, I think it's unlikely. Okay, Anna and Dorota. Hi, Dr. Chitam. Um, very nice talk. Uh, my question is with regards to your apatheline uh, drug story. I was wondering, I know this flavonoid is a PFAR alpha agonist. I was wondering if you have looked at the peroxisomes on your organoids and if you think that's another route how you're seeing the benefit. Yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty messy agent. That's the thing. It's, it's got lots of pleiotropic effects. Mm -hmm. So knowing what <clears throat> knowing what the actual mechanism of action is is the tricky thing. Um, we haven't uh, screened other drugs um, at this moment. Um, I think it'd be something be worth exploring in the future, for sure. Because what you'd want to do is try and identify the the real mechanism of action and then focus on that and maybe lose some of the other effects you get from these pleiotropic agents. Yeah. Um, uh, hi, Dr. Chidam. This is Dorota. Dorota Skowarska Krawczyk here. Um, great work towards using organoids to really for preclinical studies. Um, and I'm especially impressed 
impressed by the last example that shows how non-coding variants and mutations can affect expressions of genes locally and far away and 3D um, um, structure of the uh, loci. So, but these experiments are possible currently for photoreceptors in organoids because they are the most abundant cell types in organoids. So how to address it in the less abundant cell types and not to mention, or maybe actually very importantly, what about RGCs, um, um, which we are losing very early in organoids uh, culture? Are you working on RGCs to keep them longer? And how would you address it for the less abundant cell types? The, this uh, non-coding variants, which are or mutations, which are much more often than coding. Sorry, it's my team just keeps ringing. I don't know how I can switch it off. Sorry, um, yeah, so it's a really good question that. Where, where have you got? Here we go. Okay, so in terms of the different cell types, so yeah, photoreceptors are the most abundant cell type. Um, the ganglion cells, this is an issue, yeah, so, <coughs> I mean, sort of coming back to Chris's question uh, as well, you know, the dropout of ganglion cells is an issue. If you want to do things like multi-electrode arrays and use the ganglion cells as the, as the readout, because the ganglion cells are dropping out of the, of the organoids at the same time that the photoreceptors are maturing. So this sort of electrode approach is very, it, it's technically difficult. It's also getting to be biologically challenged by the system. Now, I think there are ways to sort of try and prolong the RGC being in organoids, but I think most, I think what you'll see is, so we do work on RGCs. Um, we generally work on RGCs in, in 2D. So we've done comparisons of, of RGCs in organoids and in 2D, uh, actually studying uh, a form of optic atrophy, which I, I didn't talk about today, but we've been disease modeling optic atrophy caused by variants in OPA1. And there we get a, basically, if you, if you use the organoids to study uh, the ganglion cells, then you, you're diluting them out with other cells. Whereas if you go to 2D, you can basically work on a, a relatively pure population of, of RGCs comparatively. Um, so we, we're sort of very much going down a route of uh, 2D culture for, for RGCs. Uh, I mean, uh, Jason Myers doing amazing work with um, his RGC cultures. He goes through an organoid step to get to his RGCs, uh, we're doing a more sort of direct approach. Um, the other cell types in there, that has lots of Muller cells. So if you want to look at some Muller, Muller cells, that wouldn't be a problem. Um, I guess you've always had the risk that something's gonna get um, diluted out in the signal. But, you know, I think as the technology is improving, you know, the possibilities of doing single cell epigenetic studies are, are now, are now almost with us, you know, in terms of how that could be adapted to organoids. Um, it doesn't make it any easier. In fact, it's just increasing the complexity all around the, you know, single cell sequencing onto single cell epigenetics and uh, as well. But um, I think that's probably the way to go around this. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of the different methods people are developing all the time to improve survival, you know, they're always slightly tweaked towards what their own interests are, whether they want more cones, the rods, whether they want better outer segments, whether they want things to be uh, more consolidated in terms of the inner structure. So some of the methods can lead to a slightly sloppy inner organization, but um, the others give you a more better ratified uh, outcome. And you can, of course, keep growing them for longer to get them more mature. But in our hands, they seem to sort of plateau around day 250 to day 300. But that's a long enough experiment for anyone, really, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry, Dorothy, did I, did I answer your question there? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. I see so, a bright so, future. Uh, Michael, this is all, Mike, this is really exciting. I have maybe more a philosophical question here uh, and maybe more futuristic question. You know, the work of Cloud Desplan and Connie Sepko about development and Swarov. Mm. Uh, in developmental biology, as you mentioned, the retina slowly matures and the cells become differentiated. There is a birth of those cells in a different time and so on. Uh, how closely the organoids recapitulate that? And if you speed it up and you start making uh, the cells, um, let's say all of the photoreceptor cells and so on, and then ganglion cells, that could cause a trouble, right? The ganglion cells, I believe, they are first. 
uh, is that there is a certain uh, choreography and, and uh, how those cells are populating and forming uh, these organoids, uh, as well as in retina in vivo. Uh, is it important uh, to really compare those two systems in vivo and, and, and organoids? Or is it good enough for certain things and will never be good enough for the other things, the organoids? Yeah, that's a really good point, Chris. Um, yeah, so it is a developmental model and it, it is, it's frustratingly and reassuringly slow, yeah? And it does actually map very well onto human developmental timescale. <coughs> if you make mouse retinal organoids, that maps very well onto mouse retinal development. So, you know, you're looking at a month to make a, a relatively mature mouse retinal organoid. Um, they've very much fallen out of, not that many people are doing retin mouse retinal organoids at the moment, you know, they were initially, you know, the main source of material for transplantation studies, but I guess everyone's very keen to move towards the, the human system. But, you know, I think there are, we're, we're actually wondering ourselves whether we should start trying to model some things in mouse because it would give us more, it gives us much higher throughput if we could do things in a month rather than in, mm -hmm. and then we could maybe compare the same mouse as a whole in vivo animal with the organoids and really get a good parallel system there. I certainly don't think we're ready to drop animal models. Um, definitely not. We keep, I've, I've still got my uh, my mouse colony and, you know, it, it's, it's very nice to have them complementary. In terms of the whole sort of choreography, I think that's critical, yeah? I, I think that's really important. Um, I think the whole key thing that made that, the successful transition from 2D to 3D it's there in the title of the papers, it's self-organizing, yeah? is that basically we're encouraging them, but ultimately the organoid is, is it's, it's internally regulating and it is choreographed, but not by us, by itself, I think. And that's, and the clock's in there as well, the clock's in there in the cells. So could we make it faster? I think, you know, lots of us would like to make it faster, but I, I am slightly worried that if we make it faster, we won't make it better. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're trying to make a source of cells for transplantation and you don't need them morphologically, morphologically mature and you don't need the right ratio of cells in a, in a system, then I don't think it's a problem. I think for disease modeling, it's more challenging. Yeah. Uh, but also when you grow those uh, cells, they, they come and make connectivity and everything else. Mm. Uh, are you uh, concerned of lack of vessels and, and even delivery, of course, not blood because you don't have that, but at least uh, uh, deliver nutrients and media uh, to a specific structure of, of the red uh, organoid? Yeah, I mean, that's probably the biggest thing for the ganglion cells, yeah? So yes. the ganglion cells being on the inside, they're further from the nutrients and the media, further from the oxygen. In vivo, of course, the blood vessels grow in along the axonal processes, you know, and they're, they're intimately related with them. So, you know, you're missing that. And also, conversely, the ganglion cells are throwing out processes to the brain and they have that connectivity there, which we don't have here. So, you know, if you start going down to the assembloid route where you're putting together retinal organoids with brain organoids, then you have the potential to enable that connectivity. Now, a lot of people do want to start doing these sort of mixed cultures of taking cells and putting them back in, you know, or, or purifying cells separately and then combining them. And I think there's some, that there's certainly some merit in that in terms of, you know, trying to add some of the immune cells back to see how the immune cells respond to it. But as you say, you know, you could put vascular endothelial cells in there, but they're not going to organize and they're not going to form tubules and you're not going to be able to perfuse them properly. You know, it's a, it's a massive challenge that. So then you sort of back to, chip-based technology where you're moving nutrients maybe through that way. But I think that there's lots of different potential ways to solve this, but they are ex extremely te technically challenging. That's the thing. And, and also, you know, when you're doing these cultures for, you know, six months, nine months, you know, your uh, enthusiasm for trying lots of different things rather than trying to maximize the data you can get out of them is, 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 is the, you know, you've really got to have a strong drive to, to, to need to know it here. Yeah. Mike, th this was wonderful. And I wanted to thank you and the entire room. I want to thank you very much.
for making us excited about this uh, approach uh, to finding the cure for blindness. Thank you, Chris.